One of the most common things I hear said by old school lefties is I no longer recognize the left. I am politically homeless. And it's true that the left has changed dramatically once it believed in free speech and now it is one of the it is certainly one of the prime prime destroyers of free speech. Um, I mean, the ACLU explicitly no longer, I and mean, the, the old joke about the ACLU was that uh, they would defend the right of the Nazis to burn down their own headquarters. And now the ACLU opposes Freedom of Information Acts by prisoners um, who want to know, female prisoners who want to know if there will be male prisoners forced on them. And the ACLU has opposed that. And the ACLU, uh, there, there have, the ACLU has put out tweets about, about banning books and, and destroying books. And it's not just freedom of speech. It's many areas that the left has, has been destroyed. And this has been a long time coming. You know, I, I, I like my book, Culture Make Believe. And in that, I really, one of the things I'm very proud of is that I wrote it in 2002 or so. And I really predicted much of the rise of the insane right as the uh, economy collapsed. And one thing I missed, and if I were to redo the book, I would add is the rise of the equally insane left as the economy collapses. And, and it's very interesting. So I wrote Culture Make Believe where I talked about the rise of the insane right among other things. And the book was very well received, very well reviewed. And in 2012 and 13, I did write a book about the rise of the insane left. And that book cost me two publishers and uh, was not well reviewed because, because one of the publishers pulled the book, which is exactly what's going on with the left right now, one of the things. And I remember a conversation I had with Gail Dines 10 or 11 or 12 years ago where we, we wanted to trace how neoliberalism, postmodernism and neoliberalism, which are two different things, both destroy everything they touch. And we, we planned out the book, but we never wrote it. Um, the book would be have different chapters by different people. And my chapter was going to be how postmodernism and neoliberalism have destroyed environmentalism. And somebody else was going to write a chapter about how postmodernism and neoliberalism have destroyed feminism. And Somebody else was going to write one about how postmodernism and neoliberalism have destroyed anti-racism. And, um, and the one I can speak to best is environmentalism. And, and two of the things that have happened is that postmodernism has attempted to teach us that um, there is no such thing as wild nature, that they're, they're, they're there is no truth and everything is permitted is basically the attitude. And if there is no such thing as wild nature, then um, there's no use protecting wild nature because there's nothing to protect. And there is nothing but, I mean, there have been writers who have literally said, you know, because Indians affected their land base, therefore, direct quote, anything goes. And there's a tremendous difference between living on your land base for 12,000 years and warehouser deforesting. And postmodernism has made us so stupid that we can't tell the difference. And, and neoliberalism, let's just, we'll, we'll move away from that term and just talk about individualism. That in the 80s was the first time that uh, the corporate media 
referred to human beings more often as consumers than citizens. And that's a huge thing because if they can get you to believe that you're a consumer, your choices are buy and not buy, as opposed to a citizen, you have a much wider range of, of resistance available to you. You can boycott, you, you can buy, not buy, you can boycott, you can organize. When a government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it. And, um, and I love the line by Kathleen Dean Moore, where what can one person do? She always says, don't be one person. You organize, you collectively work. But what's happened is that I'm gonna add in a new strain here, which I think is hopelessness. And I'm not talking about this in terms of my essay, Beyond Hope, where I talk about hope as a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. And I'm bashing hope there in a different sense. The hope that I'm bashing there is the hope that there will be some magical solution. You know, if somebody says, one of, the, one of the ways I talk about this is my mom would say, you know, clean your room. And if I would have, as a seven-year-old, have responded, well, I hope it gets cleaned. My mom would have responded, yeah, you better hope it gets cleaned. Um, in that it's ridiculous to say, I hope my room gets cleaned. The magic fairies aren't going to do it. You just do it. And so if we say, I hope salmon survive, we're saying we have no power. But what we need to do is remove the dam, stop industrial logging, stop industrial fishing, stop uh, industrial forestry, uh, stop global warming, and stop the murder of the oceans. That's what we need to do to save salmon. And if you say, I hope salmon survive, and you're not doing those, then it's an obscenity because you're, you're hoping when you should be doing. But that's not what I mean by the hopelessness now. What I mean by the hopelessness now is that things are really bad and I don't see anybody doing, I don't see many people doing much to go the right direction. And I think, I think that as well as the destructiveness of postmodernism and the destructiveness of individualism, neoliberalism, whatever we want to call it, I think in addition to, to that, so there was a line in Julia Barnes' great movie, Bright Green Lies, based on our book, where she's interviewing David Suzuki. And she says, what if, or maybe it was, um, oh, shoot, I can't remember his name. She was interviewing somebody. And she said, you know, what if, what if wind and solar aren't helpful? And the response, well, I think it was David Suzuki, said, the response was, well, we have to do something. And there's this idea that I'm not suggesting we do nothing. What I'm suggesting is that so far as environmentalism, civilization itself is killing the planet. And if we refuse to address the larger framing condition, which leads inevitably to the murder of the planet, then all of our responses are going to be necessarily ineffectual. And we know that in our guts. And when we know that in our guts, it leads to us attempting to simply control what we can, which means, oh, so if I personally don't use any styrofoam, that's the best I can do. And it's the same on the other levels too, that the violence against women is absolutely overwhelming. It's, 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 it's just extraordinary. And and if there's nothing else you can do, then one response is to retreat into postmodernism, which is just sophistry, just retreat into coming up with some sort of philosophy that will confuse you enough to numb you out. The point is that the rise of the insane left has been just as predictable as the rise of the insane right. And whenever I say this, 
there's always a few old school lefties. Many old school lefties go, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's just, it's, I'm homeless. And there are a few other old school lefties who go, um, no, that's really unfair because what you're talking about is not the left. And that's true. It's not the left that we recognize, but it's, it's the left as it has become. And so what do we do? I think what we do is we, you know, it just, it just, this is really topical and I, I don't, I'm usually not this topical, but the last couple of days, there's been this big deal of Neil Young is so courageous because he demanded that Spotify take down Joe Rogan. And when Spotify refused, he took his music off Spotify and how he's so courageous. And I, I, many of the publishers who have published my work have published books that I find odious. And it never once occurred to me to demand that they not publish something I disagree with. And the, the issue here is not, is not vaccines and the issue is not Joe Rogan, the issue is not Neil Young. The issue is um, I think that the solution, the, the issue is this is part of what's gone wrong with the left is that instead of if someone says something you disagree with, you write a better book. Instead, it's become, if somebody says something I disagree with, they should not have a voice. And that's just one manifestation of the emptiness of the modern left is that what's wrong years ago, um, Ward Churchill wrote an essay slamming Jerry Manders' book, In the Absence of the Sacred. And I asked Jeanette Armstrong what she thought about Ward Churchill's essay. And she said, if he didn't like it, he should have written his own damn book. And that's where the left needs to go back to is if you don't like how discord, and that's what I'm saying right here is I don't like where the left is going. And so instead of trying to shut them down and disallow them from speaking, what I'm trying to do is to write my own damn books and to push for a left that again believes in discourse, again believes in the natural world, again believes in physical reality, and doesn't retreat into the nihilism, the emptiness of postmodernism and neoliberalism.